Okay, now let's talk about something that I think is more interesting, something that we're actually doing in, uh, in Bangalore here. Um, my, my team is, is, is placed here in Bangalore. Um, and, uh, engineering work. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So all of this work is actually happening here in Bangalore. So I work on something called Alassia Marketplace. This is being engineered here in Bangalore. Um, and Marketplace looks a bit like this. It is a website you can go on and download uh, plugins, extensions, add-ons for Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, and so on. So if you want to extend Jira or Confluence in some sort of way, if you're using it, which chances are pretty high that I, I've talked to a lot of people here so far, and a lot of people are using Jira and Confluence, um, if you want to extend it in some way, you can go onto Alassia Marketplace um, and find maybe some sort of extension that, that works for you to extend it in, in something that you want to, in some way that you want to want to extend it in. So um, the way that this is all uh, created is, um, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll talk about the engine first. So we're going to talk a little bit about something called Nix. Uh, Nix is a particular tool that we use, but I want you to focus more on the ideas. Uh, then we're going to talk about how uh, functional programming relates to the idea of packaging and building software. Um, then we'll talk about the idea of functional programming, how it relates to operating systems. Um, and then I'll show some two examples that we have, which is development shells that we use inside of Marketplace, and then Docker images, which is how we actually deploy Alassi Marketplace. We use Nix to build Docker images, and we deploy it like that. So if you're interested in how you can build uh, Docker images without ever looking at a Docker file ever again, uh, stay until the end. Okay, so Nix is the particular tool that we use, and Nix has got a lot of problems. Um, I'm not going to be here defending and... and uh, talk, uh, defending a lot of the decisions that, that were used uh, in, the, in the process of making Nix, but the ideas, I think, are, are really important. Uh, the ideas are, uh, give us a lot of benefits. I'll talk about some of the benefits. But I want you to focus more on these ideas. Yes, you might see some weird syntax. You might not like parts of it. That's fine. I want you to focus more on the ideas than the implementation that we're using. Okay, so in the 12th century, uh, we're going back quite, quite a bit in time, uh, there was the idea of a function. There's some argument about when, if this was a 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, doesn't matter. A long time ago, functions were created. And one of the properties of functions is that if you, give a fu if you give a function the same input, you'll always get the same output. So if I've got a function that is plus one, and I call that function with, for example, 10, I'll always get 11. There's no day in the year where I call that function and I give it a 10, and I'm gonna get it, uh, back 13. It's never gonna happen. So the functions have the property that same input always have the same output. And so there was a guy called Ilko Dolstra who was doing some research, and at the time, um, he was interested in the idea of, um, of, of applying functional programming to building some software that he had to build. Um, and so that was back in 2004. He created this idea of Nix, um, which was an application of the idea of taking functions and applying it to, to builds. And we'll talk about how, how that looks in a minute. Um, four years later, he actually evolved that idea of Nix uh, so far that he was able to build a Linux-based operating system on that idea. So within four years, he got it. It wasn't a very advanced operating system, but he got it. Uh, he progressed the idea uh, fast enough that he was able to, to get an operating system built on top of that. And then uh, I think in 2014, uh, late 2014, I actually started using the Nix package manager. Um, so I was using it on Mac OS. I was using the Nix package manager, and I was installing packages and using it as a replacement as home, for Homebrew. Um, about a year later, I actually switched over to using Nix OS. So the operating system was, was usable enough that I actually just completely switched over it. And in fact, this presentation is being displayed from NixOS at the moment. I am running this NixOS operating system. Okay, sorry. Uh, so support, so everyone, first thing when I ever mention uh, 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 Nix is, is the first question is always about support. Can I run Nix today? What can I use it with? Um, so Nix, there's, there's, when we talk about Nix, there's actually many things that people refer to. Um, there's the Nix programming language. So you use the Nix programming language to specify builds and packages for your software. And then you, there's the Nix package manager. And this can get a pretty confusing pretty quickly because you talk about Nix, you might be talking about any parts of this. Um, so the package manager runs on Linux. That's primarily where people use Nix. Um, but there is, uh, a lot of people do use it on Mac OS as well. And it's pretty good support for, for a lot of packages on Mac OS. Not every package, like Linux has definitely got more packages, but Mac OS has got quite a few packages as well. I was definitely reusing it as a replacement for Homebrew back in uh, 2014, so I'm sure it's, it's probably good enough to replace Homebrew with today. Um, on top of that, um, sorry, uh, there's also um, uh, uh, WSL, which allows you to run uh, Linux executables on Windows. I've, I've played around with this, and it's actually pretty impressive. You can actually use Nix to build Windows executable files, so Windows.exe files using Nix. Um, so if you're interested in building Windows software, I don't think this has been explored very much. Um, I've, Export it very quickly, um, but it could be explored a lot more, and I think uh, there'll be some really cool stuff. Um, so if you're interested, if you use Windows and you're interested in, in these ideas, come talk to me. I'm happy to 
we'll talk more about that. Um, and then there's NixOS, which is the operating system that builds on top of the package manager, which builds on top of the programming language um, and makes an operating system out of these ideas. And then on top of that, we have something called NixOps. So NixOps is built on top of NixOS, which is built on top of the Nix package manager, which is built on top of the programming language. So you can see at each level, we kind of build on top of the previous idea. And there's a lot more tools around Nix, but these are the time, kind of the top four kind of popular uh, Nix tools uh, that, are, that are around. Okay. So if you use any type of, if you use any of these at the moment, so if you have some sort of mineral configuration, uh, this is, uh, so this, the, the, there's a guy called Steve Trugo who came up with the idea of um, a divergent, convergent, and uh, congruent configuration. Um, so if you are doing any type of divergent configuration, that is you've got a system and you just run manual scripts on it or you install Debian packages, um, or you're doing anything manually on a system, you can think about using Nix to, to, to automate that. Um, if you uh, have some sort of uh, convergent configuration, being a Puppet, Ansible, Chef, something like that, um, you can also uh, see Nix as a bit of a replacement for that. And we've started going into the idea of like immutable infrastructure, um, like using Docker images uh, and deploying using Docker images, using Kubernetes and things like that. Um, you can use Nix as a replacement for those ideas as well. This is the last one here is actually GUIX, which is a fork of Nix, and it just replaces parts of Nix. So if you don't like the particular programming language, we're going to use the Nix programming language. If you don't like that and you like Scheme, GUIX replaces the Nix programming language with Scheme. So just really quickly, this is diverging configuration. You have some sort of um, uh, current state, which I've re represented as a dotted line. That's the current state. And then at the bottom, we've got the intended state. And so state, the intended state might change over time. We might have new requirements come in. So we've got an updated specification. And so we're trying to get a system to be along this uh, solid line at the bottom. But what usually happens in a divergent system is if you're doing manual, um, manual sort of management, as you're running scripts, you might not know the actual state of the system, and it's eventually uh, diverging from the intended state. And so people go on there, they'll make a, some sort of file. That file um, might not ever get deleted when it should, be a, should have been deleted. People go on there, they modify slash etc, and they put some sort of configuration in there. Um, so eventually your systems start to diverge, and especially when you have more than one system. If you have more than one uh, 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 computer that's running these, uh, that you're trying to get uh, to be consistent to try and be this intended uh, design, eventually over time, they diverge. They start becoming very different. Um, so I've been here. Um, a lot of tools come up, so Puppet and Chef and, and so on have come up to try and make it so that you can take some sort of um, existing state, so I've represented as a dotted line here, so some sort of existed, existing state, and you can try and get it to converge towards some sort of uh, intended state. And so over time, if you give it sufficient time, eventually you can kind of say that you want this package to be absent, and so now on all your systems, you know that package is not installed. Uh, so it's ability of, of saying that you don't, want to, you don't want certain state, and you do want this state. And so you can apply this to different systems, and you can try and get towards a state. But it's always trying to take a current state, a current unknown state, into a known state. What we've started moving towards with Docker images and Kubernetes and so on is this idea of convergent configuration, sorry, congruent configuration. So with congruent configuration, your, your state should always be what you intended to be. So you fully specify what your state is, and you might notice that there's a, very, there's a tiny gap here of uh, kind of like the, the actual state um, and the intended state, and that's because we can allow things like we can say that we have all of this state known except the mount directory. So we can still have mounts that have you know, state in them that we don't know, but at least we know everything else about the system. So we can say that we know everything about this system except this part. That's the idea of congruent configuration. That's what Nix applies, not only to system configuration, but also to packages and everything. We always say that we know what the output is going to be of our system, which I think is kind of the important thing here. So we're always saying that we know, uh, we always can, can reproduce the state of a system. Okay, and so this, this idea actually applies to a lot more than what you know, Puppet and Chef and Ansible kind of apply to. This thing applies to everything. We can use this Nix thing to, to basically do any type of uh, system configuration that we need. So we can do virtual machines, uh, we can do, um, uh, what else we got up there? We've got cross-compiling, um, GUIs, people use this for testing GUIs, people use it for CI, actually my team uses it for CI as well. Um, you can build Debian packages, you can build uh, app images, all of these different systems, you can use just one tool, which I think is really, really incredible. Now my team uses um, uh, Nix for, uh, for continuous integration, so we use it to, to kind of give us all of our uh, CI tools. Um, we also use it for two other things I'm going to talk about, development shells. So local developers, people when they're trying to develop our system, 
will use uh, these development shells, to, uh, and it, which is supplied using Nix, and also we deploy all of our infrastructure using Docker images that are built using Nix. So all of Marketplace, we use Nix for, for development shells, CI, and, and uh, Docker images. Now I'm just gonna talk about the last two, uh, but I'm gonna first talk about how, how all of this works. So, so we can think about package management using uh, like the idea of, of how, how can we apply functions to the idea of package management. So, an, so you can think of a package as something that takes some sort of build input, and so that build input will be the source code, um, uh, other dependencies that it needs, um, and some sort of configuration. So you can combine all those together, and say that's the input that we need to be able to build a package. Then you've got some sort of build steps, and those are the steps that you need to take that input into some sort of output, and the output's going to be some sort of artifact, some, some sort of build artifact, so it might be a Debian package, or it could be just you know some sort of binary that you want, or so on. So you've got the idea of build input, some sort of steps, and then some sort of build output. So that's how we can represent this as a function. Uh, here's a graph of, of what you know, we see as package management, right? We've got a package D that depends on package B, which depends on package A, or something like that. So you've just got like a tree, a tree of packages. So we can represent these things using just an expression language. So Nix has got this thing called expression language or a programming language, but some people have a bit of a problem calling it a programming language because it's not very advanced, but it's enough to kind of just give you uh, the idea of functions and, and values. So some people call it just an expression language, the Nix expression language. And we can represent um, these build inputs and these steps using this expression language. And this is just a programming language, just things that allow you to write some sort of expression. So once we've got this, then uh, we can represent build inputs, the build inputs to our program. So these build inputs being uh, source code and uh, configuration and, and uh, dependencies, we can represent all of those as just values in our program. And we can represent the build states as just values as well, but these values can be produced using different functions. So here's one example. We're going to call, this is an example of, of the Nix expression language. And this is the part where Nix starts showing some of its problems, and that's fine. Um, if you want to replace parts of Nix, I'm happy for that, but I want you to focus more on the ideas. Uh, the idea here is that we're calling a function called make derivation, mk derivation. And we're giving it some values. We're giving it a name, and we're giving it a build command. And that build command is just a shell script. So we're saying, we're making a package. Derivation here you can think of as, as a package. We're making a package. It has this name, and here's how to, how to actually execute and build that package. So it's echoing hello world into some sort of out file. Okay, now we can actually refactor this. So there's something called GNU Hello. So it's a Hello World application. GNU actually publishes this. You can download it from the internet. Um, so we can actually say that this is an input to our program. And so Hello is not defined here. It's defined in some other file. But it is just, a, again, just another derivation that tells you how to build uh, GNU Hello. But we can use that in our, in our expression. Instead of echoing Hello World directly, we can use this Hello program and echo it into, into out. So now we're just using another value. So we've got just this idea of functions, so we've just got this other function here, which is hello, and we can bring that into scope and use it. We can refactor it once again. There's this other Nix um, function called run command, and it does basically the same thing as this, so make derivation and run command do very similar things. Run command says, I'm going to run just a shell script, so we don't have to say, before previously we had to say build command equals something. Run command kind of, factors out that duplication. We see this over and over again. We see this build command equals, build command equals, build command equals. So we can just use this function called run command, which does exactly that. So we are able to use functions to reduce duplication in our package management, in our configuration, and our build inputs, and so on. So we can start using functions to, to, to minimize the amount of code that we have to write, which I think is really cool. Something that's very difficult to do when you start using YAML, you often find duplication, duplication, duplication. When Nix, you can just factor that out into a function, which I think is really, really cool. Okay, so I keep using this word derivation. You can think of it as something like a package, but a derivation is kind of like the, uh, the actual serialized output that represents the build. So previously we had the idea of functions. We've got a function that calls another function, which calls another function. Once you evaluate that all down, you'll get a data structure, and that data structure represents, so that data structure is called a derivation, and that represents your whole build. So it's everything that you need to be able to build that pitted software. And it's actually a tree, so it's a tree of the, all of them, um, tree of the package that you're trying to build, and then all of its uh, parents are uh, uh, the, the other derivations that you need, which will be the, the um, build inputs, which will be the, uh, the do your dependencies, basically. So it'll be the source code that you need and also the dependencies that you need. So all of this gets compiled down to a tree, 
and it gets serialized to disk as a .drv file, and there's a program called Nix Instantiate that takes the expressions, so something like this that we've written, it'll take this expression, and if you Nix Instantiate it, it'll compile it down to a .drv file, put it on your, on your hard drive for you to be able to, um, to, be able to build. So it's a, it's a serialized representation of your whole build. Okay, so this is calling uh, Nix Instantiate on the Nix file. So this is the Nix expression. And now we've got a d DRV file. And notice how it's uh, got SN8I. I've actually truncated that. It's a lot longer. It's like a 32 character uh, hash. And that hash is of the derivation file. So we actually have like content addressable uh, derivation files. So if you were to instantiate this twice, you'd actually get exactly the same uh, file as an output. So it's all content addressed. And inside of this file, it'll have, it's, a J, it's basically a JSON file, it's not actually on disk, but basically a JSON file. You can represent it as JSON, there's actually like a, a code formatter that represents it as JSON for you. Um, and it has uh, outputs, and these outputs are gonna be what, uh, the, the, where the artifact is gonna go. And it also has this um, input derivation, so these are other derivations it's going to refer to. So in this case, we're going to refer to, oh sorry, this is input sources, it's gonna refer to the default builder. Uh, default builder is just like a thing in Nix where it brings in like a heap of sh uh, helper. A lot, of, a lot of Nix builds happen very similarly, so this is just kind of like a lot of helper functions that we use, a lot of helper bash functions that we use. Now, here's the input derivations, and these are the dependencies that we have. So we depend on bash, we depend on the standard environment for Linux, and we depend on uh, the hello, uh, hello derivation, so the hello program. So to build this, this artifact, which is just gonna be, you know, piping hello, hello, the hello program throughout, we need to depend on hello. So these are just the dependencies. Um, here we have uh, x86-64 Linux, that's what I've instantiated this Linux expression on, and so because I've run it on a Linux machine, it says that it's going to be able to be built on a Linux machine. Um, it's got a few other things in there, it's got the builder, which is gonna be bash, we're gonna be running bash, and we're gonna run it with the default builder. These are just, uh, you know, we're just gonna run bash. We're just running a shell script, right? And then we have here just a lot of different environment variables that get put on, on the thing. So when the bash runs with the default builder, it's going to use all of these environment variables, and primarily it's gonna use the build command, it's gonna run that build command, and then it's gonna pipe it out into a file and run our, run our program. So this is gonna be building an artifact. So now, now that we've got the kind of full definition of a build as a file on the, on the, on the system, we can, use something, we can do something called realization, and realization gives you an output. I know this is all bizarre terminology, instantiation and realization, and this is maybe some of the problems with Nix. Um, but we're going from, the idea here is that we're just going from this serialized um, build on disk to actually running it and, and building it. Now realization is actually not called building um, because realization can happen in a few different ways. You can build just the software, and in our case, we will just build the software. But it's, there's potential that, because everything's content addressed, right? And we have this content addressed hash of the derivation we could also realize it by going off to the internet and saying, hey, do you have an output for this derivation? Do you have this file available for us? And then we could just download it. So caching just comes for free. It's absolutely for free. So caching just, just happens, which I think is super, super cool. We just get it for free, no, no magic involved, just content addressable uh, files. Um, yes, uh, and we've got a different notion of purity. So the idea of purity we had before is that in the Nix expression language, everything is just an expression. All functions always, always return the same output. So if you call make derivation and you give it a heap of steps, you'll always get the same derivation as an output. So if you give it the same steps, you'll always get the same derivation. That's just always true. So that's the Nix expression language has got the idea of purity because the same input always goes to the same output. They're always functions. Now the, there's another notion of purity, which is that if we go to realize a derivation, Realizing it twice, the same derivation, realizing the same derivation twice should always give the same build artifact, byte for byte copy of the same artifact. So if I was to, to, to run my build at the moment, which is gonna pipe hello world into a file, running that twice, I should always get exactly byte for byte the same file, which would just be hello world. Now, in theory, it's possible for us to kind of violate this. Nix, is not, Nix provides some tools to try and uh, make it possible that uh, builds are reproducible. But you know, you can like still use call out to date, for example. You can call out to date, pipe that into a file. Nix is not going to stop you from doing that. It's just gonna provide some tools to help you to stop from doing that, but it's not going to prevent you. Now in theory, it's able to, you're able to put in, like, dates and so on into build artifacts. But in practice, uh, the Debian project and Nix have got, kind of gotten together and they've made like this reproducible uh, builds.org. Um, they've put a lot of effort into into making it so that all packages have reproducible builds. So pretty much all the packages that you get by default in Nix 
have reproducible builds, and Nix actually provides tooling for you to run the same build like 20 times and verify that they are byte for byte the same every single time. Uh, so there are some tooling tools provided by Nix, and in practice, this is actually pretty good. And in, in, in practice, um, Atlassian Marketplace, because we're using this tool, we are byte for byte reproducible. We can take the same uh, build and do it twice and have exactly the same output. Okay, so this is this is how to realize. You call next store and you say realize. There's actually commands that do both the instantiation and the realizing together. I'm just showing you kind of the underlying concepts of how next works. So you've got the idea of realization of a derivation, which will give you an actual artifact. So we can cut that file, and we got hello world. That's how to do hello world in Nix. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was a bit complicated, I know, but uh, there are easy ways to do it. I'm just showing you kind of how it, how it works underlying. Cool. So now let's talk about how to apply the idea of functions. So we've got the idea of functions to packages, right? We've got the idea of functions being same inputs, same output. And to packages, same input is the same, uh, same source code, same, um, there's two levels, so let's start with the, with the expression language. With the expression language, same values that you provide to, the, to functions should always return the same value. Um, so with the next expression language, calling make derivation with the same things will always give you the same output and always serialize the same file on disk. So that's cool. Second level is that when you go and realize the derivation, so once you've got this build definition um, in your system, on, on your disk, and you try and realize it twice, you should always get byte for byte the same artifact as an output. So those are two levels of, of functions, functions there. Um, so now we can apply that same idea to operating systems. How can we think about functions, uh, sorry, operating systems as function? I'll show you, this is a, a partial, um, partial configuration of my system. So this is what I'm running right now. This is only a part of it, there's a lot more. Um, but for example, I have Docker enabled, I've got OpenSSH enabled, and I've got a Brian user, and I've got a UID for that Brian user. Now there's a lot more on there, I've got things like, um, I've got Xmonad, which is a window manager that I use. I've got a heap of different system packages installed like wget and things like that. Um, there's a lot of other configuration in there. I've got firewall rules. Firewall rules are all defined using this. So I'm using this Nix programming language to fully specify my operating system, which I think is pretty cool. So we can think of about function as uh, operating systems as, as functions in, in the way that we specify the, the operating system as just kind of like a, uh, a data structure, and then we use functions in that data structure. When we have configurations, when we go and use NixOS, we can uh, say, build this, build this operating system for me, like build the configuration for me, and it'll get registered as something called a profile. Now those profiles then get put into something called a derivation. Whenever you say, I want to boot from this build of, like so, so the, um, the profile contains things like the kernel, um, the packages, the etc configuration, um, the path, environment variable, things like that. So once we have a profile, we can register it as a generation on our, uh, on our system. Once we register as a generation, it kind of gets put onto your grub bootloader, and I'll show that in a second. Um, but one thing we can do is after we keep changing configuration, if we change it maybe like uh, 50 times over a month, I can say garbage collect the ones that I'm not using anymore. So we'll go back through history and say, I don't actually use that configuration anymore and get garbage collected. But until then, what they will do is show up in your grub bootloader. So for example, when I boot up, here's an example, I have 20, generation 24, so anything before 24 has been garbage collected already. But everything from 24 to 33 is still around. And so for anybody here who's screwed around with Linux graphics cards before, you're probably familiar with having a system that doesn't boot. Um, it's very frustrating having a system that doesn't boot. And so what you can do with Nix is everything gets registered as a generation, so you can go back to a previous generation. So if I make, some, if I make a change in my Nix OS configuration and it no longer boots, I can go back to the previous version. So this has saved me a lot of times. So I've changed configuration, I've changed IP, uh, IP table rules or, or something like that. I can always go back to the previous one and try again. Really useful. Okay, now to what Marketplace actually uses Nix for. I personally use Nix OS, but what does the Marketplace team use, use uh, Nix for? One thing is development shells. So here is, I don't have Python installed on my system. Uh, there's no Python actually on this system. Um, what I use is something called Nix shell, and you can open up a bash shell with a particular package installed. In this example, in the top one here, I'm saying Nix shell dash p python, which means give me a bash shell, but put python on the path for me. And so any bit of software that I want to use, I can just open up a Nix shell and start using it. I don't have to install it. I don't have to go and do an apt update or anything like that. I can just do a Nix shell dash p, put in the, put in the bit of package, the, the, the package that I actually want, and I can start using it straight away. Now what you can do is write a shell.nix file, and our, our, um, all of our all of Marketplace's uh, projects have a shell.nix file, and you can go into that directory and type in nix-shell with no, no, no arguments, 
and it'll just open up a shell with all of the dependencies that you have for your package installed. So um, for us, we have like Node.js, Java, things like that. And then um, the team actually uses something called Durand, which automatically, as soon as you go into a directory, it'll run that next shell and give you just a shell with all your dependencies involved. So you can just change between directories and have all your dependencies uh, in scope, which I think is super, super cool. So you could have one thing that has like Node.js 8, and over here you can have Node.js 10, change between the directories and just silently, it'll just switch between the versions of Node.js. This is an example of a shell. So you can say make derivation, you give it some build inputs. Uh, so for example, Node.js, what's this, zero, eight, Node.js eight, yarn, git, you know, we've got all of these things that we need when we go to build our software. Um, last line is interesting, we're calling a function called optionals and we're saying if it is Linux, we also want Firefox, because in our CI system, sorry, in our CI system, we also have um, uh, uh, like a UI test, and that UI test uses Firefox. So we've optionally included uh, uh, Firefox in Linux. Okay. Shop with one last, um, one last example. Um, Docker using no Docker files. We don't use any Docker files on my team, but we do use Docker. We have an internal platform as a service inside of Atlassian. That internal platform as a service takes Docker files and then spins up AWS instances, puts the Docker image on that, um, on that EC2 instance and then runs it for us. So we give, uh, we, we push our, some Docker images up to a remote registry and then we let the platform as a service take, take control of everything else. But we don't use any Docker files in the process there. We actually don't even use the Docker daemon at all. So Docker files look a bit like this. You say from, for example, Alpine, install a package, here we're gonna install Calsay. Um, then we're going to, uh, we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna actually run the CalSay. If, when we go to run the Docker image, we're gonna run CalSay, and then we're gonna expose port 8080. I'm just put the port 8080 in there for some example. You know, it's not actually used in this example. Um, I've got some questions about this. What version of Alpine is this using? Latest? What version of CalSay is it? Latest? What version of Perl, so Kelsey is built on Perl. What version of Perl is it using? Whatever comes with Alpine, right? And what version of libc is it using? So th these, these are the questions that I ask, right? And if security comes to my team and they say, what version of libc are you on? We've just found a vulnerability in libc. What version are you on? I have to go into the Docker image and have a look, right? It sucks. Had to do this. Um, so instead, with Nix, right, everything is reproducible. We know what version of, of libc is going to be there. We know what version of Alpine we're running on. Everything has to be fully specified. And this is, I think, is a really big benefit in terms of security. We know exactly what version of everything is without even building it. We don't have to go and look at the build the artifact. So here's an example of a Docker image built using uh, Nix, and there's no Docker involved at all. There's no Docker files involved. So here we have, um, so notice how it's not imperative either. It's not kind of saying do this and then do this and then do this and then finally we get a Docker image as an output. We're saying, we're fully, we're, we're having like a, a, a declarative way of specifying the Docker image. So here we're saying build the image, give me CalState as a content on that Docker image and we're gonna build it on top of Alpine. Now I've not specified either CalState or Alpine in this file that, I've, that I'm showing you. They're coming from a different file but each of these is fully specified as well. CalSay has to say that is version 3.2.1 or something like that. There's no possibility for it to say that it is CalSay, um, you know, the latest version of CalSay. It can't say that, it has to say exactly what version it is. And the same thing with Alpine. In fact, Alpine, when you say, uh, when you say from image, you actually have to give it a SHA-256 hash of the base image that you're, coming, that you're going to be using. So it's fully specified. We know exactly what version of Alpine is going to be coming in. Okay, and then we've just got, you know, we're gonna, these are two of the things from the Docker file. We're saying which, what command it is and what expose it is. We're not doing it in an imperative way. We're not saying line by line what we want. We're saying, you know, these are the actual, uh, this is the actual configuration that we want. So that's how to build um, Docker images without Docker files. The way that this works is that it um, build image goes off and it uh, actually supports the Docker, um, uh, Docker specification for images. It supports the container format. So it actually knows that you need um, like a table, and then that table contains all of the files, and then it needs a JSON descriptor. That JSON descriptor then has you know the exposed ports command, and also you know the base image that's going to be built on top of. So 
Nix actually understands like that someone, this is not a built-in part of Nix, someone has written Nix code that understands the, Nix, the Docker format and then builds uh, Docker format images using Nix. So no Docker is involved at all in doing this, but we are able to deploy to Docker. Cool. So the idea here is the idea of functional infrastructure, but applying the idea of functions, so functions taking same input to same output. The idea that I'm trying to show is the idea of taking this idea, this, this same input to same output, and applying it to packages, applying it to the language that we use to, to write these packages, and then applying it to operating systems. Now my, my, my team takes, uh, gets uh, really good benefits in, uh, for deploying Elysium Marketplace. We've got byte for byte reproducible builds. If I build on my system today and I build on my coworker's system in a year from now, I can build byte for byte exactly the same thing, which I think is super, super impressive. And yes, we know, um, so CI and dev, exactly the same system. So when I go and deploy something on CI, I go through CI and I'm doing something on, on, on development, I know I've got exactly the same versions every single time. It's no different. And finally, we've got known versions for everything. So if, I, if someone comes to me and says, what version of curl is on your system, I can look, I can tell them without even going and building, building the software. I can just look at the code and see everything. Or I can instantiate it and get a derivation, which is the build definition, right? I can go and say, here's the build, def build definition. Does this tree contain curl 1.3 in it? And answer the question. Cool. Thank you. I actually didn't see you. I actually didn't see you pin a version in any of the code slides that you showed. So where exactly does the pinning happen? Uh, that's a that's a really good question. Um, pinning. Um, you know, I'm gonna actually just show you. Uh, I'm gonna jump to next packages and I'll show you a package. Um, I, I have no idea what this package is, but. And here it will say the version is 1.9. And here's the SHA-256 of the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. Is that better? Okay. Okay, so supposedly there's a package called Galaxis. Supposedly this is a package and it has a version 1.9, so we're specifying the version. And here's the SHA-256 of the source code. And this is like this is pinned in Nix packages at the moment, and I can refer to exactly which version of Nix packages I want, or I could just copy and paste this file into my project or whatever I want. So pinning happens through this. This question, hello. Yeah, this question is related to the same question which he asked. So the Docker file which we saw earlier, it didn't have the version, right? So. Are you referring to this version only? That it would take the version from this file? Um, so is the question around, uh, sorry, let me. So you're talking about this file? Yeah. Like uh -huh. from so yes, we, we, we haven't specified here exactly what version we're talking about, but we ha we're referring to something called Alpine. We're, these, are, these are variables, right? These are declarations that are made somewhere else. So somewhere else there is a declaration of Alpine. And in that declaration of Alpine, it does say exactly which SHA-256 of Alpine that we want. And there will also be CalSA. And so I could find the CalSA in Nix packages and say this is exactly the version of CalSA that's specified. So yes, not, not here, we haven't specified it, but in another file that this file refers to, we have fully specified it. Okay. Uh, I have a question, uh, Brian. So for somebody who's learning uh, Nix expressions, uh, what type of editor support is available? Uh, syntax highlighting or, uh, you know, uh, yeah, showing um, errors? And I use Emacs. I use Emacs, which works as well. But um, outside, of, outside of Emacs, there's VS Code support. Um, you're going to have, a, like, learning Nix is a very difficult process, and so syntax is a very minor part of it. The rest of it is very difficult. Um, but yeah, VS Code, Nix, I think uh, VS Code, Emacs, and, and Vim all have pretty good support.
Any other questions? There's one. Um, other than the DSL, is there like any first class language support for writing complete files? Like is, 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 it, is it extendable with some kind of a language? There is, yes. Uh, there is work on uh, extending it with Haskell, um, which might not be the direction you want to go in, but um, I'm very excited for that. <laughs>